Salam everybody, I hope you are all fine. Welcome to my master's class, Contemporary U.S. Political Thought and Foreign Policy. Today's lecture stands for that of week number eight of our semester two syllabus. I'll try to go at slow speed so that you could catch what I'm saying. Following up on what we have covered so far, Today we shall focus on the military dimension of the U.S. containment policy. And today's lecture is titled The U.S. Political Establishment and the Militarization of Containment, the Formation of NATO. As you can see, the lecture is divided into four major sections, which you will discover as we move on in this presentation. Section 1 provides a brief historical background. Section 2 examines the declared objective of the NATO alliance. Section 3 looks into the U.S. stratagem or the undeclared objectives of NATO from the U.S. perspective. In Section 4, I'll present you with this, the assigned reading material in relation to the lecture. At the outset of this lecture, here is a brief historical background to the formation of NATO, which will refresh your memory about a number of things that we already saw together in our past sessions. You remember in lecture number 7, we said the imposition of the Berlin blockade by the Soviet Union led to the intensification of contacts between the United States and its Western allies in order to create some form of defense arrangement, a kind of military pact. This was meant to give the strategy of containment a military dimension. We also saw that the blockade drew to a completely unproductive end. And with that, the Soviets decided to tighten their grip on the Eastern European countries that were under their domination. The Soviets also decided to sever diplomatic relations with the Western powers. Troubled by what they perceived as mounting Soviet threats and the pressing economic difficulties they were going through, the Western European countries accepted to fall under the American umbrella. They in fact initiated unrelenting discussions with the United States towards creating an American-led military pact. From that perspective, this was deemed necessary to complement the economic steps that had already been undertaken towards implementing the U.S. design containment strategy. Historians and political commentators of the time dubbed this emerging order in Europe as an American empire by invitation. In April 1949, the United States and 11 other countries officially formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, commonly known as NATO. The treaty was signed in Washington on the 4th of April 1949 by the representatives of the 12 founding member states of the alliance. And these were Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Note that West Germany officially joined the alliance in 1955. The United States and its allies actually no longer regarded Germany as an enemy. The USSR was now the enemy par excellence. Because of the interventionist American political thought reigning at the time, NATO therefore became the first peacetime entangling an alliance with foreign powers in America's entire history. As you know, any alliance, strategic treaty, or defense arrangement usually has both declared and undeclared objectives. And the North Atlantic Treaty 
was no exception. So let's start with the declared objectives of this alliance. And without delving into too much factualism, the newly formed alliance had one major overtly declare, declared objective, and that was to provide a military shield behind which the American-sponsored plan for Western European economic recovery and integration would go forward. NATO was in fact meant to be the military instrument for the implementation of the strategy to contain Soviet action in Europe. And in the process, safeguard the pro-American liberal system in the old continent. As you will see from the provided reading material, the North Atlantic Treaty recommended a variety of actions aimed at reinforcing Western defenses against what Truman called, quote, aggression and the fear of aggression, end of quote. But it was the collective defense provision, as articulated in Article 5 of the treaty, that represented the cornerstone of the pact. The article strongly cautioned that any attack against any member was to be considered an attack against all other members, and it would therefore be met jointly with appropriate force. You will, f you will find here attached the full text of the treaty, including, of course, the famous Article 5. Now let's try to analyze the stratagem which the United States designed in order to use the newly formed alliance in the promotion of American strategic interests. In other words, we try to shed some light on Washington's undeclared objectives with regard to NATO. And in order to fully understand the undeclared objectives of the United States regarding the formation of NATO, we need first to answer the two following fundamental questions. One, how did the United States really perceive the role of NATO in its Cold War strategy? Two, what did the American political establishment seek to gain precisely from that European-based security system that was in the making? As part of the answers to these two questions, we should keep in mind that from the end of World War II to the formation of NATO in 1949, the US political establishment was to strategically shift its focus from domestic affairs to foreign affairs. That is, the challenges, whether real or imagined, to American security were to become the major national preoccupation. And here, of course, we mean security in both its military and economic dimensions. For Washington, London and Paris, the alliance was meant to ward off threats from both outside the alliance and from inside it, namely from the USSR and Germany respectively. NATO's first Secretary General, Lord Ismay, actually summed up the deep-rooted purpose of the alliance when he confessed that it was created to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, the Germans down. So it's a quote here. He confessed that NATO was created to, quote, keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Full stop, end of quote. For the Truman administration and all the others that succeeded it, from Eisenhower to George W. Bush Sr., the fundamental purpose behind the creation of NATO was to reinforce the anti-Soviet apparatus of containment that was in place. The U.S. political establishment was actually only opportunely conforming to George Kennan's vision 
and the ideological manifesto of the Truman Doctrine, which we saw together previously. In reality, the U.S. sought to use the newly formed European-based security system to shield itself a distance from any potential Soviet military threat. It also sought, of course, to safeguard its strategic and economic interests by monopolizing the profit-generating recovery program for Western Europe. So the Marshall Plan and what came after it, of course. Yet, despite the full involvement of the United States in the pact, American policymakers, and for that matter, their allies in Western Europe, did not actually at any time envisage an imminent all-out war with the USSR. NATO was in fact considered just one instrument amongst other ones in the long-term strategy to keep the Soviets and their allies in check. It was basically meant as a deterrent against Soviet plans short of war. And that was very important because the Western powers led by the United States did not seek war because uh, it was not in their interest and it was not obviously uh, something that they were that they wanted to uh, uh, waste off their resources and everything so they wanted NATO as an instrument of, of uh, containment uh, as, an, uh, as a deterrent short of going to an all-out war with the Soviets. Washington's policy planners believed that American strategic superiority and a fully reconstructed Europe would in the long run render possible the task of containing what ideologues called the Red Peril. According to American expert predictions, Western, especially American economic superiority, would be key to victory in the all-out showdown with international communism. By the same token, what they perceived as the fundamental flaws inherent in the communist system would eventually lead to the downfall of the Soviet Union and its allies. Those were the predictions. We shall see how accurate they really were when we address, hopefully in the coming weeks, the question of how the Cold War ended and also the repercussions that this would have on both the United States and the USSR and their allies uh, respectively across the world. Let me round up today's lecture by saying a word about the backup reading material you are instructed to attentively read and explore. This will enable you to adequately take part in the evaluation and analysis, either orally or in writing, of a number of related elements. These include, namely, one, the U.S. role in the emerging order in Europe and the world. Two, the Alliance's foundational principles and objectives from the American perspective. Three, the major contours and legacy of American political thought and foreign policy under the Truman administration and beyond the Truman administration. Your assigned reading material actually comprises two items. A primary text, which is the full transcript of the North Atlantic Treaty, and a journal article titled Another Such Victory, President Truman, American Foreign Policy, and the Cold War. This article was written by Arnold Offner and published in 1999 in Diplomatic History. So that's it for today. I hope to see you soon, inshallah. Keep safe and please stay in.